Good morning and welcome to Exchange Avenue Baptist and our church at home service. As you are preparing to worship God this morning, would you make sure you have your cup of coffee, make sure you have your Bible, and make sure you prepare your heart for worship this morning. We are going to seek the Lord with our whole heart, leaning not on our own understanding. So I just want to encourage you that, that God will direct your steps this morning if you allow him. If you humble yourself and look to him, the author and the perfecter of your faith. We're going to be starting a new sermon series this morning in 1 Peter. And so as we are uh, studying from God's word this morning, will you tune in to what God has for us from his word? For he loves you and he cares for you and he wants you to know that you are secure in him today. Will you pray with me? Our God, we come before you today thankful and grateful for all that you have done for us. God, thank you for Jesus who saved our souls. And Lord, we, we ask that you would have your way in this time. God, you are good. And we praise you and we worship you today. Would you provide for us, oh God, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a joy that is only found in you. Oh God, would you continue to move in our hearts and our lives. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
time of worship this morning. We're going to sing a song called Nothing Else. And over the course of this final song, I invite you wherever you are watching from this morning uh, to, to spend some time meditating in the presence of our God, meditating in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray um, in, in our sanctuary on Sunday mornings, we pray that the Holy Spirit would, would have his way in our hearts. Where you are today in the sanctuary of your heart, 
I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to move in your heart today, that you would allow your heart to be challenged. And I pray that the Lord would move in your life today. As we sing about being in the presence of God, I pray that you would, you would find some time today to worship God with everything you have through this song. Let's sing nothing else. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time of singing praises to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Let us continue with the mindset of worship by giving back to our Lord with our tithes and offerings. There are two options for giving here at Exchange. The first is you can go to our website, exchangeokc.org, and you can give online. Or you can mail in your offering to the church. Our God has given us everything, and he paid the ultimate price for us to have a relationship with him. Let us continue to worship him with our tithes and offerings. For he gave everything for us that we can be with him. I'm so thankful for our church and how we have continued to give through this time of a pandemic, we are continuing to reach our community as we love God and love others for the glory of God, the good of the city, and the salvation of souls. Let us now turn our attention to the Word of God and worship Him through the preaching of His Word. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. For Lord, you paid a price that we could not pay. For Christ died for us. He took our place on the cross paying a sin debt, a debt that we owe. And God, now we have the opportunity to live for you here on earth and dwell with you here on earth. And God, I pray that our lives will be a living sacrifice. And Lord, would it be holy and acceptable to you. God, I pray that you bless the gift and the giver, that Lord, that you would open up opportunities for us to continue to serve our community. And God, I pray that we would see souls saved in the coming days. Oh God, would you speak to us through your word, as we seek to worship you today. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for that time of worship and praise. Let us continue with the mindset of worshiping our Lord and Savior as we examine God's word. Today, God has a word for you from 1 Peter chapter 1. And I just want to encourage you today to lean into the text. Let us learn from God as he is speaking to us today, for he is our hope, and he wants to encourage you today that you can place your faith and trust in him, that no matter what you are going through this morning, you can hope in him. No matter what is happening around the world, you can hope in him. No matter the circumstance, the hardship, the sin, Whatever is taking place in your life, you can trust in God and hope that he will protect you. Hope that he will hold you secure. Hope that he will continue to love you. For we know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no judgment for sin, for our sin has been covered, and now we have the gift of the Holy Spirit to live and walk with God on earth. That doesn't take away the challenges that we encounter here on earth, but rather it shifts our perspective from a worldly perspective to a heavenly perspective. This morning, the aim of the sermon is to examine three realities to live with a heavenly perspective a living hope. In Christ, believers have a living hope regardless of our current circumstances. We are called to live with our eyes on our eternal hope in Jesus Christ, which reminds us of our adoption into God's family, secure in him and waiting eagerly to be home with him in heaven. Let us Seek God today by laying down our defenses to follow him, the author and perfecter of our faith. This sermon aims to examine three realities to live with a heavenly perspective, a living hope. And what we will see with that living hope is that living hope secures you from eternity past. That living hope guides your present, and that living hope ensures your future. But before we jump into a living hope, I just want to turn our attention to the text and really just see the first verse this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for this day that you have made. We thank you, O oh God, for how you are moving within our church. We pray, O oh God, that you continue to move 
continue to work. That you would have your hand upon us. Oh God, we turn to you today for we need you. Oh, we need you every hour we need you. Speak through me, oh God. Hide me behind your cross that your truth may be communicated and hearts may be changed. Saints may be edified and those who do not believe God, may they come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. By way of setting the context for the book, we know that the author of the book is Peter, who happens to be an apostle, so one of Jesus' twelve disciples. So he walked with Jesus on earth. And the twelve, minus Judas, were given the opportunity to be apostles. So what does the word apostle mean? It just means messenger. But then there is a distinction between a messenger for Jesus and the 12 apostles of Jesus. Do you see that in the text? It says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Peter was called by Jesus to be his disciple and then given the designation, the place, the role of apostleship. And so now we know that Peter is actually a chosen individual who has a specific role. And the apostles were known as men who could speak for God, men who could preach, men who could heal, men who could do miracles while they were here on earth. And so Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write the very words of God for us to read today. When you read this book, 1 Peter 1, as when you read the rest of our Holy Scriptures, do you see it? As God writing a letter to you. These are the very words of God. We must treat them as such. So it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then notice what else it says in verse 1. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Now to understand this elect exiles of the dispersion, we really need to jump into a biblical perspective of what it means to be an exile. Because we can read this verse right here and say, okay, the elect exiles of the dispersion. So Peter is writing to those first century believers who are chosen by God, who are exiles, so this earth is not their home, and they're dispersed from their home in these cities that he is writing. We can see that. But I want to give us a greater understanding this morning of that word exile. I want us to see how biblically, from the Old Testament onward, Christians and believers have been exiles. So as I've said, the purpose of this sermon is to examine three realities to live with a heavenly perspective, a living hope. And so the first reality is this. You were created to dwell with God in paradise. You were created to dwell with God in paradise. You can turn in your Bibles or just listen as I read from Genesis chapter 1. It says this in Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 26. Seven. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Jump down to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Then there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So I just want you to notice from the get-go that God made man. We did not evolve from another animal. We are unique. And if you read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God made us unique over all the animals, and he gave us dominion over the world. He made us in his image. No other being, no other creature, no other animal or plant was created in the image of God. And so we are unique. God created us to have a relationship with him, to live with him, to dwell with him. Turn in your text to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says this, And the Lord took the man and put him in the midst of the garden to work it and keep it. Verse 16, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of 
every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So notice, before we go into the content of what we just read, notice that God is dwelling with man. So God created man, and then God placed him specifically in a place, in paradise, in Eden, where there was no sin. It was perfect. Man dwelling with God. God dwelling with man. The creation was paradise. God gave the man an order, though. Notice what he said. You can eat of any tree, any plant that I have placed here in the garden except one. And if you eat of that one tree, you shall surely die. So we have an interesting interjection of the first command that was given to man by God. Sin has yet to enter the world at this point. But then, as you read chapter 3, the serpent enters the scene. And the serpent tempts Adam and Eve and basically says, did God truly say and questions the authority of the very word of God? And so as they think back, they start questioning the authority of the very word of God. And as they question it, he just simply interjects, oh no, God is lying. If you eat of this tree that God told you not to eat, you will become like God. And you know the difference between good and evil. So the Adam and Eve ate. Sin entered the world. Judgment came down upon them. And as we know, God is walking in the garden and he's looking for Adam and Eve. Of course, he knows where they are. But Adam and Eve are hiding because they're ashamed, because they're now full of sin. And so I just want to turn your attention to Genesis 3, verse 22 and 23. It says this, Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like uh, one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So man was created to dwell with God in paradise, but then man sinned. But God in his grace and mercy didn't allow man to continue to live in that paradise. Why? Because man could have, Adam and Eve could have gone to the tree of life. And they could have taken a bite of that tree of life. And they could have lived eternally, become immortal in that state. So now they were living in a sinful state. And God did not want them to go to that tree and live in that sin, sinful state for all of eternity. So we have this interesting shift because sin has entered because of man's action. God is separating himself from humanity because of their sin, but he also loves them and has mercy upon them. So this shows God's heart for humanity. This shows that God longs to dwell with us and we should long to dwell with him. For you see, you were created to dwell with God in paradise. Next, let's examine the second reality, which is you can dwell with God on earth through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's turn in our text because there is an interesting connection here from Genesis. If you notice, chapter th 4 talks about Cain and Abel. If you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of the things not seen. For by it the people of old received their condemnation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Catch this, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So notice in the text what's going on here. We have jumped 
from Genesis to Hebrews, we have now shifted all the way from the, old, the, the very beginning of the Old Testament now into the latter portions of the New Testament. So what do we see in all of this? That the story of God it, with humanity is one of the same, that God longs to dwell with man and man should turn to God and dwell with him. So it is possible for man to dwell with God even in a sinful world. So let us continue in Hebrews chapter 11. It says this, in verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became the heir of righteous that comes by faith. So notice that the faith of these saints in the Old Testament is providing them a hope, a living hope to dwell with God on earth. They're, they don't know the full picture. They don't have the whole canon of Scripture like we have. But they know God and they're seeking to live according to His ways. So Abel can be accounted as righteous. Enoch can actually please God. Noah can be accounted as righteous. And as what we're going to see here, Abraham obeyed God when he was called to leave his home and go out and receive an inheritance in the land that he was going. And when he went out not knowing where he was going, by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Heirs with him of the same promise. Catch this. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah received power and conceived, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants of many the stars of heaven and as many of the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers, and catch this, exiles on earth. For people who speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he is prepared for them a city. Did you see that in the text? That all these saints in the Old Testament, from Abel to Sarah and Abraham, had faith in God that provided a living hope that they could not only dwell with God here on earth after the fall, dwell with God, walk with Him on earth, please Him, and, and, and follow Him, obey Him, know Him. They had that hope, but they also had a hope of a future with God. They knew that they didn't see everything clearly, but they hoped that one day a Messiah would come. And that Messiah came in Jesus. That Messiah came in Jesus. And in Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to dwell with God here on earth with all our sins forgiven by him and have the hope of an eternal life with God in heaven. 
Notice, in the Old Testament here, Abel offered a sacrifice to God that was pleasing. But notice, in his death, Abel still speaks. My brothers and sisters, don't take the mundane of life and treat it as it's not holy. For Cain did not offer the proper sacrifice. That sacrifice was just an offering of worship, like coming to church, praying to God, reading your Bible, seeking to worship God with what we have. That's what Abel was doing. And that's Cain missed the mark. And because of that, Cain's heart was jealous and he killed his brother. So you see here in the text, God didn't call Cain and Abel to our great task, but Abel was faithful. In the mundane of life, will you be faithful? Not all of us will be called to be Noah. Not all of us will be called to do something great and miraculous in this lifetime. We might have to be the Abels. But notice who speaks. His mundane life. His life of faithfulness. His life of just seeking to honor God day in and day out. Worship Him and serve Him. That is speaking because of His hope in Jesus Christ. It changed His actions today. You see, you can dwell with God on earth through faith in Christ. These men and women of the Old Testament looked towards the coming Messiah. Jesus Christ is that prophesied Messiah. And today we are waiting for the Messiah's return. Our God is going to come back sometime in the future. We don't know when, but we know he's coming back. We can hope in his return. We can put our faith and trust in his return. And we can wait eagerly for his return, knowing that as men and women who place their faith and trust in Jesus, we have a home that is in heaven, not here on earth. Did you catch this in the text regarding Abraham and the former saints? That they desired a better country. They could have gone back to the one in which they were called. But they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. My brothers and sisters, do you desire a better country, or do you desire a reformed country? Is your hope that you will have heaven here on earth? Hope that the United States of America is God's chosen. My brothers and sisters, you need to lift your eyes from your circumstances, from your life, and check your citizenship. Yes, I'm an American and I'm thankful for it, but my greatest citizenship is in heaven, for that is an eternal citizenship. And I am waiting not for a society, a culture, a kingdom that is built by human hands, our country, but I'm waiting for one that is built by the God of the universe. I'm waiting for the one that is going to be perfect, where the lion lay with the lamb, where there will be peace on earth, where there will be no war, there will be no mourning, there will be no bloodshed. What an amazing opportunity. That is coming. That's a reality. But is your hope for that, or are you trying to make it happen here right now in a lost and dying sinful world? It is hard to have hope in the things not seen when we're continually focusing on the things that we see. Where are your eyes today, believer? Are they controlled by social media, cable TV, the news? Is your opinion, is your hope controlled by who's in the political office, who has control of the Senate and Congress? Oh, my brothers and sisters, let us drink deep of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. For we are exiles here in a lost and dying world. Our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. The epistle of James says, Of our life here on earth, it's but a vapor. It's but a mist in the perspective of eternity. Where is your focus? Are you focused on eternity, or are you focused on the life that is but a twinkling of an eye? We've seen this morning that you were created to dwell with God in paradise. We saw, second, 
that you can dwell with God on earth through faith in Christ. Thirdly, let's jump back to 1 Peter and see that your living hope is to dwell with God in heaven. Your living hope is to dwell with God in heaven. You might say, well, Pastor, I haven't seen much hope in this sermon. I can tell you it's coming. Let's look here in the text with me. It says that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied in you. So we've seen the reality that humanity has been exiled, if you will, from the presence of God since the fall. That all believers are exiled, they're temporary resident in a foreign place. That all believers from able through the saints in the Old Testament, they saw themselves as a temporary resident in a foreign place. And as they saw themselves as a temporary resident in a foreign place, notice that they're elect exiles, that God chose them to this way of life, that they're now chosen men and women of God who are foreigners, temporary residents, living in a foreign place. They're on a work visa. You're on a work visa. We, oh, brothers and sisters, might have a passport of a worldly citizenship. But our true passport is our faith in Christ. It trumps everything. We have, in Christ, an eternal citizenship. So notice, we are temporary exiles here on earth. And Abraham called himself a sojourner back in Genesis 23, verse 4. And Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 said that the saints from Abel to Abraham saw themselves as exiles on earth. And so these exiles on earth, like us, were chosen by God and were, what? Of the dispersion. Of the dispersion. There's two ways of interpreting that word dispersion. The first way is a physical way. The physical way of interpreting dispersion is this. Your hometown is, say, Oklahoma City. So to be dispersed from Oklahoma City would be to not live within Oklahoma City. That's what happened to the believers when they were living in Jerusalem, when the persecution arose after the stoning of Stephen. The church was there in Jerusalem, but when a believer was slain, the church scattered and dispersed. That's why James writes to those who are dispersed. But I would submit to you that this, that the interpretation here isn't just a physical interpretation. As Peter is writing to those who are dispersed in physical cities, but it's also a spiritual dispersion. Notice, to be spiritually dispersed is to be a Christian, a believer in Jesus, who sees that they are in exile here on earth, that they have a temporary residence here. So they're dispersed from their home. Where is their home? In heaven. So they're here on earth and they're waiting eagerly to return to their home, their one true home, when Jesus comes or they pass. So Peter is writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And with that interpretation, he wrote not only to those in the first century, but he's writing to us today. He's writing to us today. And do you see where he shifts in the text? He says that they're elect exiles of the dispersion. And notice what it says in verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God. You might say, well, pastor, let's get to the hope. Well, we're going to see the hope here in verse 2. Our hope is in the foreknowledge of God. Did you see that? Here in the text, we have the Trinity. The first part of the Trinity is in God the Father. The second part of the Trinity is in the Spirit. And the third part of the Trinity is in Christ Jesus and the sprinkling of His blood. Now here is the hope for every believer in Jesus Christ who's living with a living hope. 
First, that the elect exiles of the dispersion are dispersed, they are elect, and they are exiles. Notice what? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This means that your current circumstances, as an exile here on earth, you're a foreigner, you are a temporary resident living in a foreign place. Your home is heaven. We are just temporarily here on earth. God knew that, and He, by His foreknowledge, by His sovereignty, He had a plan. And He has a plan for you today. Now, are your eyes on God's plan or are your eyes on your current circumstances, your current hardships, what you're struggling with, with what's going on in your life today? Where are your eyes? I want to challenge you, my brothers and sisters. Let us focus on God. Because as we have seen from Genesis, you were created in the image and likeness of God. So you were created by God. You were created with a purpose. And for a purpose, you have a great high calling upon your life. And your great high calling upon your life is to follow God and do His will on earth. To serve Him with your whole heart, leaning not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledging Him and allowing Him to make your path straight. My brothers and sisters, will you rest in the foreknowledge of God today? Will you find hope in the foreknowledge of God today? God knows where you are. He knows the hardship, the struggle. He's never left you. He's asking you today to trust in Him. For you are secure in the foreknowledge of God. So we're seeing right here in verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, that a living hope secures you from eternity past because of the foreknowledge of God. Let's go on. So according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ. Wow. So when we are saved, we're given the Holy Spirit who indwells us. So I was saved at five, and the Holy Spirit came into my life. I was made a new creation. The old was gone, the new has come. And you know what God has done through His Holy Spirit living in me? He has sanctified me since that day. And what is the meaning for, of sanctification? It is a, a term that means being made more into the image and likeness of Christ. So the Holy Spirit in me is helping me, refining me, molding me to look more and more like Christ daily, to be slow to anger, quick to listen, and slow to speak. To be marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The reality is the good that I do in my life is because of the Holy Spirit, not because I am good. I was completely and totally depraved before I met God. I I could not do anything good. And I needed Jesus to save my soul. And He did. He forgave all of my sin, past, present, and future. And I can now live with God here on earth, led by by His Holy Spirit to sanctify me, but also notice what His Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit does this. He sanctifies me for what purpose? For me to obey Jesus Christ. So we've seen now the Trinity, that the foreknowledge of God is at work to secure us, that the, sanctif- that the Holy Spirit is at work to sanctify us, and we are called to now live like Christ. What would Jesus do? We are sanctified to obey Jesus Christ. So we are called not to live for ourselves any longer. We're called through this text to be a living sacrifice. To lay our lives down for Christ. 
So as we are exiles here on earth, as we are temporary residents of a foreign place, we're not called to uplift our opinion. We're not called to go and do what we want to do, live how we want to live. No, we're called to advance the kingdom of God here on earth by laying our life down, being the light of the world, and going on mission and doing His work like Jesus. Jesus went into the world, went to the lost people, the lost sheep, of Israel, and he went after them, loving them, caring for them, helping them. My brothers and sisters, we can learn a lot from this little bit right here on how we are to relate with those who don't believe like us. Do you love your enemies? Do you love those who persecute you? Do you pray for them? Or do you berate them? It is sad to see how many people right now are canceling people with our cancel culture. How many people are berating others on social media for having a differing opinion. And that goes non-Christian and Christian. My brothers and sisters, we must be marked by love above everything else. If someone does not agree with us, us hating upon them isn't going to help the matter. Us arguing with them isn't going to help the matter. The only way that will help is if we point them to Jesus and show them the reality that He loves them. And allow Jesus to transform their heart. Allow Jesus to save their soul. Allow Jesus to do the work that you can't do the supernatural work. For we have seen our hope is in the foreknowledge of God the Father. We are secure from eternity past. That our hope is in the sanctification of the Spirit, the seal of our salvation, and our guide in our present time for the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now let's see our hope is in the sacrifice of Jesus, whose blood paid the price for all of our sins on the cross, and in doing so, secures our future. So we have an interesting verbiage here. It says, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, for the sprinkling with his blood. Now, the sprinkling with his blood is referring to the reality that it cost Christ's blood to cover our sins. There were three times in the Old Testament that the priest would sprinkle the blood of a sacrifice upon the Israelites. And I would argue that the best interpretation here, based upon those three, is the reality that they needed their sins washed away, and it took the blood of a sacrifice to cover their sin. And so the reality is this, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I am covered today by the blood of Christ. He has washed me white as snow with blood, which is an amazing word picture. So he's washed me white as snow, but I live in the reality that I have been sprinkled. Which means this, that as I walk through life, even as I sin here on earth after I have been saved, I am living under grace, not under the law that condemns. Because I am under the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. His blood covered me. His blood washed me white as snow. And so this verbiage is this. I am secure in the future because of Christ's death, because of His resurrection, and because of His ascension. He paid the price for me on the cross so that no matter what I do here on earth, sin I commit, I can't sin myself out of God's grace. Wow, what a security. That for me provides me a great hope that I don't have to save myself, that I don't have to do good works for that salvation. I am called, as we have already seen, to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ. So it's not that I don't do work for God, that I don't follow Him, that I'm not seeking to be made more and more into the image of Christ. I'm not just living as I please, but rather, I am secure in my future, knowing I can never lose my salvation. And can I tell you what that provides me here on earth? A living hope. You were created to dwell with God in paradise. You can dwell with God on earth through faith in Christ. And your living hope is to dwell with God in heaven. 
Will you today, my brothers and sisters, turn your eyes from earth to heaven? See the reality that you are a citizen of heaven, and we are awaiting a city that is built by the hands of God. This world will be imperfect and will always be imperfect because of sin. And until Christ comes back and judges the world of sin, it's going to continue to be full of sin. Let us not be controlled by the sin of this world, but rather let us be controlled by our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be his name. He gives us a living hope in Jesus Christ. He provides us a power in the Holy Spirit to walk with him. And so notice how Peter ends this section of Scripture. May grace and peace be multiplied in you. That is my prayer for you, is that God's grace would be multiplied in you. That God's peace would be multiplied in you. There is much to worry about in our day and our age today, but we have the hope of Jesus, a living hope. We are eternally secure We are guided by the present time, by the Holy Spirit, and we are, our future is ensured by Jesus Christ and His blood. We have a hope. We have a peace. We don't need to be controlled by this world. We need to pray for this world. Pray that Christ would come back. Pray that He would use our church to continue to make disciples and reach many people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God's peace be multiplied in you, and may his grace be multiplied in you. Oh, God has given us much grace, and we're living under the law of grace today. What a gift. May you, oh brother, sister, give that grace that you have been given. Extend it to those in whom you live. Instead of living through the cancel culture. Let us love our neighbor as ourself. Let us pray for those who persecute us. Let us love our enemies and follow God. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, simply pray to him. Ask him to save your soul. And if you do that today, would you email me, john at exchangeokc.org? I simply just want to connect with you and help you in your faith journey. But our God loves you, and he died for you. He paid a price that you can't pay on the cross, that you may live with him here on earth and also for eternity in heaven. And Christian, you have a living hope. Let us live as people who have an eternal hope that is empowered by an almighty God. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you for the faithful saints who have gone before us, from Abel to Enoch to Noah to Sarah and Abraham. Oh, God, you've given us examples of men and women who sought to follow you, live by faith. Were they perfect? No, they weren't. But God, you, you were with them. God, you led them. God, you loved them. And we see that written in your holy scriptures. God, I pray that we would be men and women who trust in you. That our faith would be the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not yet seen. We know that you are returning, O God, and we pray today, O God, that we would live as men and women who have that heavenly perspective knowing that you are going to return. And that is the reality. Not being controlled by this world and the sin that is in it, but rather seeking to live as your workmen here on earth, doing your will. Give us the strength, O God, to follow you. We give you this day. We give you our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.